It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. Take Command Podcast. What's up? What's happening? I'm Craig Hoffman. He is Logan Paulson. And as promised, Take Command Mock Draft 1.0 is coming uh, in 15, 20 minutes, somewhere in there. (laughs) However, Logan, the Commanders cannot keep hiring or cannot stop hiring coaches. And thus, uh, we will discuss first some of the new additions to the staff. Uh, Also announced that tomorrow, Thursday, as we sit recording this, Cliff Kingsbury and Joe Witt Jr. will meet the media, so we will probably, uh, you know, be able to get a lot of answers to some of the questions that we have. Uh, but Cliff Kingsbury, Joe Witt Jr. speaking to the assembled press tomorrow. Logan, I actually don't know this. Did you get a chance to talk to either of those guys today on Command Center? Or are you guys doing that tomorrow? We're doing that tomorrow. So there okay. will be a show. I think that and that show will come out the following week. We're gonna have interviews, probably film breakdown. So really excited. We haven't had access to coordinators like that before, so it should be pretty insightful. So. Yeah, for sure. Can't wait for you to get on the board, especially with Cliff, but also with Joe, um, you know, a guy that that is so well respected on the defensive side. We kind of blow over that one because we know DQ's defensive prowess and there's, I think, less questions there, even though he's a first time DC. Uh, but we will certainly look forward to that. Uh, as for what we know now, um, and who knows, maybe we'll get even more stuff <laughs> as the, as we're recording this. But the big name that just came down was Anthony Lynn, uh, who is yeah. going to be the run game coordinator. He was the running backs coach and assistant head coach in San Francisco for Kyle. He will not have the assistant head coach title, which I think is interesting, Logan, in part because that means they still have it for someone else. And there's very few spots left on the staff, but you do have defensive line coach still open. You have running backs coach still open. So we'll see if, if they can lure another big name potentially with that title, or do they keep it in reserve to ultimately promote someone down the line? But I think as this staff has started to come together, you and I have noticed a pattern and kind of the there is starting to be a common thread that ties these coaches that Cliff Kingsbury is hiring on the offensive side together, even if a lot of them are coming from varied backgrounds. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's probably a bunch of patterns, but the one that I think that sticks out to us, and again, you talk to somebody different and they might come up with a different solution or a different kind of answer to the puzzle. But I look at Brian Johnson and what they did in 2022 with Jalen Hurts, and they were maybe one of the most innovative run game teams in in the NFL. You know, they kind of popularized this RPO kind of triple option. You know, the two huge plays from Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl are models of that kind of RPO system, right? Where it's you read the end, and instead of me running, now I can throw the ball and run the ball. And that was – Jalen Hurts just did a great job of murdering with that. They had answers how to beat that versus man-to-man coverage. They had answers versus zone. You know, all of these kind of RPO stopping concepts, and they were very, very innovative there. So I look at that and I say there's a guy who knows how to run the ball out of gun, knows how to marry passes out of the gun, and is, was pretty innovative or saw a staff that was innovative in 2022. You look at Bobby Johnson, the offensive line coach, and say what you want about, um, you know, the the Jets or the Giants, excuse me, like they do a great job in the run game there of running the football from the gun. They, you know, they pull offensive linemen. They kind of do stuff that I think of as like kind of Bill Callahan outside zone where you're getting down blocks and pulling around, but they get there from gun setups, which is really, really challenging to do and really innovative. And so I like that. I like his, the way he protected the offensive line there. Again, ran the quarterback there also. And then Anthony Lynn, I mean, you're not going to find a more effective rushing team in the NFL than San Francisco in terms of how they create angles, how they, um, you know, find angles for the offensive line, how they utilize receivers in the blocking surface, how they just find these matchups and alignments through formation to put those guys in the best position to be successful. So I think one of our, one of my reservations about Cliff, you know, I think he's a brilliant guy. At least you talk to anybody and they're saying he's a smart guy, great coach. The list, the list of, uh, you know, kind of modifiers. Are the posit- yeah. Are yeah. great, you know? Um, but you know, like, Oh, he needs someone who's going to support him in the run game. And this looks like a staff that's going to be very supportive of developing a very layered and nuanced rushing attack. Cause like we talked about in our, in our pre-production meeting, like he, he wants to run the football. You look at the 2012 tape and it's not like you get a guy who's shying away from running the ball. It's uh, just he, 2021, yeah, 2021. When James Connor in, in Arizona. Yeah. 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 He's very effective. And again, some of the runs aren't the most nuanced, but it's not a guy that's like, Oh, he, a guy, it's a guy that I see understands the value of it. And now it looks like he's assembling a staff of people who 
A, can support his kind of innovative nature in the pass game, but also kind of layer stuff underneath it to make those rushing the, the rushing game more efficient, which, I, again, like, I don't know if you can tell, I'm pretty excited about that, that, uh, that the staff is coming together like this. Yeah, ultimately, they've still got the questions to answer of how do they work together. There's a bunch of people yes. with different backgrounds, and that's we're not going to know that answer for a while. But I think what we can surmise now is that there is at least a reason this isn't random like not that i ever yeah. thought that it was it was just a little harder to see what the connective tissue was but you now see like great experience and and i think actually you know we were talking about this in, in our in our pre-show call like that 2021 tape they're actually under center a lot more than i think yeah. people realize Right. But the efficacy of running stuff from the gun, which is where Cliff is most comfortable as a play caller and as, as a coordinator, and as a designer. Um, but the, the comfortability of running from the gun and the ability, Anthony Lynn is, is I think, most respected uh, in my quick perusing of the internet and kind of some different takes on him. For someone who marries the run and pass game very, very well, he's very cohesive in how he, he brings it all together. Um, that's kind of been his track record. And he's done it, by the way, not only with Kyle in San Francisco, but very different run scheme with Greg Roman back in right. Buffalo back in the point. day when he was the running backs coach um, and, and helped Greg Roman, who was the OC there. So there, that ability to, to mesh the two things together and kind of bring a level of cohesion to the offense feels like it'll be Lynn's responsibility along with Cliff as much as anybody else's. I think the other common thread with Bobby Johnson, with Brian Johnson, is they've worked with running quarterbacks. Now, yes. what does that mean in terms of the draft? Everyone wants to connect the dots. And the answer is, I don't know. Um, and I don't think they know yet. I don't think they have a final say on who their guy is, who their number one target is, because they still want to bring these guys in for interviews at the combine, interviews uh, at their pro days, spend some time with them over the next couple of months and really get to know who they are as people. But as players, we know there is an RPO element that Caleb Williams has done very well with. We know that there is a mobility and a really an electricity as a runner that Jaden Daniels brings, even if a lot of his is better off of the scramble game than the design run. And then Drake May can run it as well, like in the same way that Sam Howell, we wish he had run it a little bit more. Right. Um, as a runner, design runner last year. Um, I think that that all three of those guys, this makes you feel more confident that they will use the dual threat nature that they all have at the next level, no matter who they draft. Yeah, and I think the thing that sticks out to me is like you mentioned the Greg Roman thing, you know, and then the connection with Kyle Shanahan for Anthony Lynn. And I think that's just, you know, what are they going to be? I don't know. But I think having a guy that has answers like, this Greg Roman, who to me is maybe the most innovative run game coordinator over the last 20 years in the NFL, like with Colin Kaepernick, Lamar Jackson, like say what you want about him. Like he is detailed and dialed up. So you have that in your background, right? You have that bag of tools to pull from. Oh, like how did we do that when I was in Buffalo? Oh, yeah, we did this X, Y, Z. Then how did Kyle do it? Oh, maybe this solution is better. That's awesome, you know? And I think, you know, Brian Johnson also, or Bobby Johnson, excuse me, he was in Buffalo too for a long time. And like, they probably know some of the same people. They probably have a pre-existing relationship. But I think to your point, like you see guys that have had to be creative, like Bobby Johnson having to be creative with Daniel Jones and like an understaffed offensive line. Like you, you saw creativity there, right? Anthony Lynn, same type of thing. Like maybe not creative in like the necessity type of way that Bobby Johnson did, but like he just comes from this varied background. So I think it's going to be kind of cool again, we, we don't know how they're going to work together, but the backgrounds these guys have. And, you know, Brian Johnson, again, probably more of a pass game guy, but they were really innovative running the football in Philly uh, two years ago. So lots of cool pieces here. And, again, it makes you think, wow, like all these guys with all these different skill sets, all these different experiences, maybe they get this thing pointed in the right, right direction um, from, from an early start. And I love the fact you mentioned that he marries run and pass game concepts together because you could – in 2021 – in Arizona when Cliff was there, you saw an effort to do that. You saw an effort to kind of adopt some of those principles. Um, they just weren't always able to do it because, again, Cliff's background's a little bit different. So now you've got all these people that have experience with that, and I think that's going to be pretty outstanding. And, um, again, it's it was a staff that I was nervous about, you know, a couple of days ago, but I'm starting to feel better about it the more these pieces come in. And I think the experience, the diversity of their backgrounds, and the problem-solving elements they've all shown in their career I think are pretty exciting. Yeah, we talked about how problem solving can be one of the most important traits that a coach has. Um, so I would say I would say a couple of things come to mind for me. One, 
it's going to be really important that their processes are clean. Um, their processes yep. are clean, right? And that's ultimately going to be on Cliff, but it's something that Dan can help with as well as the head coach, right? Do they have a system of feedback where everyone's voice is heard, but the right voices are weighed and ultimately like you don't get in a bunch of fights over stuff and, and you exit the coaching meetings with a clear message to communicate to the players? Because uh, if, if this works, this could be incredible. If it doesn't, you're Carolina last year. And that, that's the <laughs> spectrum. And like, I don't say that flippantly. It's just is the reality. Like they had a bunch of smart dudes in the room last year in Carolina and it was a mess. And frankly, the same thing happened here. Uh, maybe not the the level of coach they had in Carolina where they had Frank Reich, had Thomas Brown, had a bunch of other guys that that immediately got jobs other places. And it was just like, yeah, we couldn't, that that didn't work. But like the, the story that Sam and Nikki wrote in the post about kind of some of the stuff that happened with EB was the coaches and the coordinator. And, you know, I'm not, placing blame on any part of that equation, but like they weren't on the same page and it had a mm. real effect on the outcome of the offense. So their, their processes and their communication has to be extremely clear. I think the other thing where you kind of are on the, the edge of the optimist pessimist coin is, you know, when Brian Johnson took over, uh, in Philly as the OC, like the offense took a major step sure. back. Was that because some of the things you hear was that was Nick Sirianni's preference and Johnson was st stuck executing some of what Sirianni wanted and that wasn't super clean. Um, you hear some rumors out of Arizona that when Cliff went to put his staff together, he didn't quite have the resources uh, and the go ahead, the sign off to, to do everything he wanted. And maybe that left him a little understaffed in Arizona. And you hope those things are true if you're a Washington fan, because that means the upside is there. And here, resources aren't an issue. I think that's pretty clear by this staff. Like they've, this is an expensive staff, and their Harris ownership group is like, cool, sign the check, let's go. Yeah. Um, obviously, the the pessimist side of that coin is that that wasn't the case. That was people putting out stuff to make excuses for guys that they like, and you know there are real blind spots and weaknesses that could come up and and cause issues here in DC. So um, it could go either way. We're not going to yeah. know until at the very least the fall. But those are to me like the two opposite signs of the coin and where that coin, the, the table that coin is rolling along is the the communication and the processes. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And, it, you know, just like any team has to come together, like there sometimes the the sum of the parts creates a, a better whole, you know, and I think that's kind of what we're waiting to see is how these guys work together, the chemistry they have, the communication and, you know, like in on paper, everyone, you know, everyone's got a pretty good resume in the NFL if they've been around for a long time and all these guys have. So, um, I think there's a lot of good things to be excited about, a lot of innovative thinking to be to be kind of, you know, excited about. But how do they come together? How do they communicate with the players in the building? You know, we saw that a little bit last year with EB. The communication style wasn't right. Is the environment right? Is their relationship correct? Is their relationship to the players correct? And I think that's where a guy like Dan is going to be super helpful because he's going to be able to make sure that that is, is pretty streamlined. So I'm hoping that, again, it's just – all these people are kind of in the right positions. It's just about, like you said, them coming together and do you get something special, like where you get a really good team of coaches or is it, or is there a little bit of friction and egos get in the way or, or whatever. And, and we're, not, we're not trying to put anything bad on them before they even start, but it is a possibility and yeah. it's something to We're consider, also not trying but, to get ahead and say, this is all going to work before it starts. Right. hundred percent. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think I'm, I think I'm excited. Like the more, the more I look at it, the more excited I get. And I love that he's Cliff. Dan, whoever is kind of responsible for these these staffing hires, is filling in spots and finding people that supplement stuff that he wants to do and has done in his past. So I think that's great, and I think that's a good step. So that that makes me excited. But again, they all got to come together. They all got to gel. For sure. Uh, and last but not least, on the offensive side, Tavita Pritchard and yeah. Bobby Ingram brought back. I do think that it's really important to keep someone or someone's and maybe the quality control guys will say the same like who knows what happens down down staff I, I think making some new hires there is really important to make sure that you have some of your rising star types that eventually can step in when these other guys get jobs uh if this thing goes well um but i, I think having someone in the room or someone's in the room who has familiarity with the players and how they learn and how the, some of the the you know things that went wrong last year went wrong and some of the things that went right went right is is essential having some institutional knowledge and um, I saw Jahan Dotson like tweet out some prayer hands emojis he's very happy to Bobby Ingram is back um, and then we see you know Tavita Pritchard I, I think is very well liked and respected not only in the building but around the league so mm -hmm. I think those are two solid choices to to bring back and bring a level of continuity. 
uh, even if again, like they're going to have to learn the system and, and implement it. Uh, but there's again, a lot of guys around that can help with that process. Yeah. And I think it's also good to just have some people who can give you some insight on some of the things that maybe went wrong last year, you know, and kind of give you some intel on that. But again, to those two guys that stayed, I think, you know, I've had a couple of conversations with Tavita. He's just very charismatic. And I don't want to say he's Sean McVay, but he's got kind of that personality, you know, the guy that is dynamic and I don't know how he is as a coach, but as a person, he's great. He seems to fit really well with, um, with what, uh, with, with Dan's vision of the staff. And um, that gets me excited. And obviously Bobby Ingram, like, he knows Santana and Fred really well. So had a couple interactions with him through that. Again, that kind of, I, I don't want to say players coach, but a guy that really engages well with the players. So I think that's all good stuff. And I think it just shows you the direction the staff is going and uh, the energy around the building yesterday, you know, people were in there kind of taking care of some administrative stuff and, the energy is exciting, man, and it's good to see that kind of energy from the staff, which hasn't been there for a couple of years. So it's it's a cool cool experience. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, any earlier um, thoughts on on the defensive side of the ball? Uh, they obviously had Ken Norton, who's got a tremendous history. Um, you know, a couple other guys that that wind up. Sharif Floyd uh, yeah. comes in. You know, is a guy who DQ knows real well. But any any uh, history or thoughts on any of the defensive guys they brought in, in the last couple I mean, of days? Honestly, when they hired Witt, and then I forget who the defensive pass game coordinator, the guy from Oakland, his name escapes me at the moment. Uh, Jason uh, Simmons. Yeah, Jason Simmons. I was like, this is going to be a good staff. I mean, that's like a bad thing to say, but those guys, their, their pedigree, their resumes, I think are pretty dynamic. You know, they've got a lot of experience, like kind of flipping defenses quickly. They've obviously, uh, Witt has worked with Dan and Dan, like knowing Dan from Atlanta, like he's going to surround himself with good people. So I, I knew those were good. And then obviously the guys you just mentioned, the Norton's coming in, these guys that have a ton of experience coaching the NFL, maximizing position groups. I think that I feel very good about that staff because it seems to have a, you know, a very kind of cohesive trend of people who fit this, um, you know, I don't say Dan's defensive vision, but it's, you know, cause it's wits, but, um, but I but think like, wits work for Dan for years. Right. So like it, there, there seems to be a very cohesive vision there as you know, right. Compared to the offensive staff, where we we're a little uncertain, not because they're not talented coaches, but they just kind of seem to be coming from different areas. This doesn't really feel like that. You're like, oh, this is how he knows this person. This is how he knows this person. It seems very straight, and I feel like that side of the football is going to be playing really well here um, with, with some with some good coaching and uh, and a very clear defensive vision. So. No doubt. And some players. Uh, so we've got a lot to talk about on that front over the next couple of months. We'll do a free agency primer here soon as free agency is coming up quicker than we think. But it is time, Logan Paulson. It is mock draft season. Mock draft 1.0 for us next. It is time for mock draft 1.0 here on Take Command. Logan, does it feel good to be back in the war room? If you're watching on YouTube, you got the draft in front of you. It does, man. It's exciting, you know, like, uh, and again, like the draft is so funny. I had, I had a coach tell me one time, and I didn't even think about this, but it's so much prep. It's 400 guys of prep for like five picks, you know? And so like, this is always just a reminder, like all that work for just such a, such a small thing. So, yeah. And we, you know, you do, you run a bunch of mock drafts if you're a team to try to do a bunch of different scenarios. And I will, I will tell uh, the listening audience, I did a test run to make sure I remembered how to use this little mock draft simulator. And lo and behold, when I hit start draft, I was very confused because Caleb Williams was on the board. Uh, we're going to let, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to let the uh, computer pick for every other team, not Washington. So Logan and I, we do mock drafts later on in the process. We'll pick for everybody. Yeah. But for today, for mock draft 1.0, we are going to go through pick 40. So we'll get the, the commander's first three picks. We will let the computer pick for everybody but Washington. Also, we are going to pick as ourselves. We're not trying to anticipate what Adam Peters and company right. will do. We're going to so do really. what we would do at these spots. Right. I mean, they don't know what they're going to do yet. So, you know, their guests, their guests would definitely be better than ours. Uh, but... Uh, it, it is, we're, we don't have any Intel. We're not doing this based off information. We're doing this based off of our thoughts for positional needs and what we think of the players and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, when I hit play on, on the first one that I did as a test, uh, the bears <laughs> took Drake may, 
And I was like, sure, I'll take Caleb Williams at two. Right, Select. Right. Um, I doubt that's going to happen again. I guess we're about to find out. Any other uh, disclaimers or things that we want people to know before we dive uh, in? And, and we'll, we'll go through a couple of picks as we go through the list that are surprising to us, you know, of the sim, just to give some context. But yeah, it's yeah. You know, computers picking, so. Yeah, so we'll we'll definitely give some feedback. We are using PFF's mock draft simulator, uh, which is obviously going to lean into their rankings. If we used another mock draft simulator, this might come out differently. Uh, that's all the background. Three, two, one, Logan. Time to start the draft. Bam, bada, bam, bada, bam, 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 bam. All right. Uh, the team before us, the Chicago Bears, has taken Caleb Williams, which wow. leaves the top player. I know, stunning, <laughs> stunning especially after they didn't on the last one. Um, so that leaves top players on PFF's board uh, just to, from a position or a position list uh, standpoint. Marvin Harrison, Drake May, Malik Neighbors, Joe Alt, Brock Bowers, Roma Dunze, uh, Cooper DeJean, the quarterback, uh, cornerback out of Iowa. Uh, on down the list, obviously, Jaden Daniels is going to be someone that we're going to consider. Yeah. Uh, Dallas Turner, Jared Verse, the top two edge guys. Uh, but Logan, I, th I think that we are both in the camp right now that quarterback is the way to go. Uh, yeah. But it, let's let's play the game for a second. If you weren't going to go quarterback, what would you do? So if I wasn't going to go quarterback, I would try to trade back. Obviously, that would be the first thing I would do, right? If I could trade back out of this spot, I think that would be excellent. Again, because, uh, you know, if you don't love one of the quarterbacks and someone else does, they're going to pay a lot to move up for that spot. And I look at right. all these dynamic playmakers. You got your Marvin Harrison Jr., your Malik Neighbors, your Joe Alts. Like, those guys – like, Joe Alt and Marvin Harrison are really easy projections to NFL starters. So let's say you got one of those guys at five, for example, right? And you got another pick in the first round, and you're able to draft another dynamic playmaker. You know, name your guy. Because I do think there is a lot of talent in the top 120 picks of this draft that you should feel good about. So if you could add picks there and add a pick next year, I think that's 100% the way to do it. But, you know, like, I think it's going to be really hard, honestly, to pass up on a quarterback at two, especially because I think you're going to fall in love with one. I think the staff, I think teams on the league are going to fall in love with one of these guys because I've already fallen in love with one of them. And um, I don't know how you feel, Craig, but I think we should probably take a quarterback. Or do you want to trade I, back? I think so, too. So my dream scenario, I was telling you about this the other night, and, and you were very excited about this. My dream scenario is that, the quarterback that we don't fall in love with or that Washington doesn't fall in love with is the one New England falls in love with and that someone else is also in love with that guy. So essentially what you can do is trade back one spot because you can call New England and say, hey, you like Drake May, right? And they're like, yeah. yes. And it's like, okay, we want, we want Daniels, but we are comfortable trading back to five or whatever else because we think we can get someone else that we really love and the let's say it's five because that's the giants right yeah. uh or the giants are at six so like hey we don't love our guy that much that we wouldn't trade out and go back to six so if you want drake may you got to make a trade with us mm. at three we'd rather go back to three than six but if you don't make the trade with us we're going to trade back to six and the giants are going to take your guy now you get to fleece new england out of something move back one spot still get your guy and get an extra asset that's the dream scenario but you yeah. also can't overthink it. You don't yeah. want to lose your guy and you could get played by New England and they could wind up stealing your guy uh, from you. So I think that if if you like one of these quarterbacks, you just don't mess around. You make the pick. And I think that's what I would do. I, the, I would also point out just from an informational standpoint, if you want to get an extra first in this draft, Arizona is the team you want to trade with because they right. are sitting at four. They have Houston's pick 27 and I actually wonder, like, would this trade get accepted? Four and 27. Yeah, it says would likely be accepted. So four and 27 for two. Mm. That's that's very intriguing, especially yeah. if you're going to wind up at four getting Marvin Harrison Jr. or Joe Alt. Or maybe can you convince Arizona that they that Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to get drafted by someone else like that to me is the ultimate scenario. But. I do think I would probably just draft a player. And I think that player is the same guy you want to draft. Which is who? Who's your guy? Jaden Daniels. Yeah, Jaden Daniels is my guy too. I, you know, And again, we're still early and quarterbacks are hard to evaluate. And again, the difference between them is very small. But they're just in that 2023 season, he was awesome. And again, he turns down open receivers to run the football. He's not a perfect prospect. But there's something about it, man. The ability to make plays when you need to make plays. There was something, you know... That reminds me of the playmakers at the position in the NFL. And I just thought 
that's the guy. And it was a down year for Drake May. I acknowledge that. 2022, he looks awesome. But, you know, I'm, I, the recency bias is high for this, so I would probably go Jaden Daniels. I would too. I just, I look at the way, you know, you can't punish him for having open receivers, uh, especially when all he does is put the ball in stride to the open receivers down the field. Like that accuracy still yeah. is accuracy. Even if he doesn't have to make as many contested throws, he's going to have to make at the next level. He also doesn't throw the ball over the mi middle of the field as much. That was kind of the offense, but you do see him hit throughout some of the, the season, yeah. like some backside digs and like those throws are there on his tape. They're just not as frequent because of the way the offense is called. The thing that you obviously need to figure out is like mentally, how is he going to operate in this offense? Right. It is a space read type of offense. It is not a, prog a pure progression type of offense or sorry, a, a coverage reading kind of offense. So like how does... How does his ability to read your offense match up with his skill set? Um, that's the question. But from a physical tool standpoint, great arm strength, great accuracy, unbelievable explosiveness as a runner. Does need to learn how to not look like a cartoon character when he gets hit. Yes. Um, but other than that, like there's a there's just a ton to like. Yeah, a ton to like, and uh, you know the middle of the field thing. I think is 100 percent valid. You know because I think that's one thing Drake May does really well. Um, but I do think he's accurate and he's not afraid to be aggressive with the football. And again, he's thrown to some really good receivers, but I like the aggressiveness that he showed, right? He's not all the time, but I like the tight window ability. I think there's some value there that, that seems to translate better to the NFL level. And again, it, the draft's a crapshoot, but if I had to pick today, which is what today's February, whatever, it's four, like, February 14th, don't tell Valentine's your wife that day. you don't know what today is Valentine's day. And, uh, if I had to pick today. I'm picking Jaden Daniels, but I do reserve the right to change my perspective <laughs> on this as we get closer to the draft. For sure. And the last thing I would say about Jaden in the air raid and specifically Cliff, think about what he did in Arizona. It's like, let's get yeah. Hollywood Brown. Let's get DeAndre Hopkins. Like, I want to push the ball outside to my receivers. That is how he ran that offense. It wasn't an and offense that ran a ton over the middle of the field. So that's when people draw the, the RPO connection and the personal connection to Caleb, the air raid connection to Drake, I'm like, I don't know. You want a guy who pushes it down the field on the outside, outside the hashes? Jaden Daniels, bam, that's your guy. I will say when I was watching the film last night, pulling clips for for the show, one of the things that came out to me was like, they are, he, or I don't know if this was, if this was a Cliff thing or if this was a Kyler thing. Anytime on the backside of three by one, they're running goes. They're not running backside digs. They're running goes. Goes are comebacks. And and I, they got so many explosive plays because like on the backside of three by one, even if it's cover three, they're going to play match or man coverage to that single receiver side. So if you've right. got a guy over there like Terry McLaurin, like Jahan, a guy that you think can win those consistently, they had um, A.J. Green and Hopkins, obviously, just Decent. ripping by people. And they found a ton of explosive plays. And when you watch LSU, there's a lot of similar similarities there in terms of that deep ball accuracy, that touch to layer it in over the defender and give your guy a shot in the right position. So I think that's a great point. In addition to the, the quarterback running stuff, in addition to the RPO stuff, in addition to uh, some of the play action pass stuff, that deep shot aggressiveness is something that I think you see in the air raid all the time. And you see it in Cliff's offenses, especially the last time he was calling plays at the NFL level. So the card has been sent in. Jaden Daniels, that is our pick in Mock Draft 1.0. All right, we'll now watch Drake May goes three, uh, Marvin Harrison fourth. Uh, if you Pretty want to pause any so point, far. yeah, Roma Dunce. Uh, I set this That's, on slow so we could kind of go through it. Malik Neighbors, I'll stop it for sure at 10, but if anybody yeah. sooner. Uh, Cooper DeJean, the corner out of Iowa, seven. Nate Wiggins, corner out of Clemson, eight to Atlanta. Olu Fashanu, nine to Chicago. And then the Jets take Joe Alt. Um, so that is where we are through 10 picks, Logan. Anything uh, super of note there? Yeah, I don't think Cooper DeJean goes that high. I think Cooper DeJean's an excellent, an excellent football player. I think he's... Like he's so fun to watch. He returns punts. He's got great ball skills. He's got great instincts for coverage. I think the combine's going to be big for him. His film's awesome. Like his film's amazing. But is he a safety? Is he a nickel? Is he kind of that hybrid Buffalo nickel linebacker? Because in college he plays all of them and he's good at all of them. He plays outside corner. But like, what is his role? And again, that lack of elite athleticism is a little bit makes me a little bit nervous. And I think athleticism is a wrong thing to say. Because he is a tremendous athlete, like his coordination's off the charts. But mm -hmm. you know, is he does he run a four does he run a four five or does he run a four three? And I think that'll really affect his draft stock. So I don't know if he'll go that high. Also, Joe Alt going after Olufushanu, little surprising. I feel like Joe Alt's a lock. 
Um, but I think the other picks in that in that range are, are pretty spot on. They they feel like guys that'll go there. Obviously, no. Did Brock Bowers go in the top ten? I forget. Uh, no, we don't have Bowers yet. So that yeah. that's one guy. But that's the thing is like you get a positional run on receivers. Uh, Harrison, Adunze, neighbors, then corners, Dijon, Wiggins, and all of a sudden you're looking at a Brock Bowers outside the top 10. Like some one of these guys is going to fall. You can't have 12 top 10 players. That's how it works. And I think the other thing about the storyline there is only two defensive players in the top 10. I think that's how it's probably going to go. I think the receivers in this class are awesome. So I think you're going to see a lot of them go early, a lot of them and, and often. Like, And I so I think that feels very realistic because honestly, that's the best – Probably the best position group in the draft class this year. Yeah, for sure. And there's going to be more to come. All right, let's continue on hit play, resume draft. Vikings on the clock at 11. They'll take Brock Bowers. There he goes. Uh, 12, Bo Nix, QB4 off the board. Uh, Dallas Turner to the Raiders. Uh, by the way, Nix to the Broncos. Talisi Fuaga to the Saints. Uh, Jazaran Newton, or J- sorry, Jerzon Newton uh, to yep. the Colts. Terry and Arnold to the Seahawks, uh, Latu Latu, your guy, UCLA to Jacksonville, JC Latham, the tackle uh, out of Alabama to Cincinnati, and then Jared Verse, uh, edge out of Florida State to the Rams, uh, and then Kenyon Mitchell, the corner out of Toledo to the Steelers. So in those 10 picks, Logan, what stands out to you? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously Bo Nix going 12. I uh, yeah. I, I understand that that's kind of the hot thing right now. Is it AJ McCarthy going there? Is it Bo Nix? It'll be interesting to see how that actually plays out. Obviously, they're looking for a quarterback. They're looking for a young guy. And people are pretty polarized on Bo Nix. I, I was pleasantly surprised by his film. People are pretty polarized on AJ McCarthy. His film, I, obviously the athlete, the physical ability is there. I just, the consistency is hard to find because he's only thrown the ball like 150 times in college football, you know, so not a lot of throws. Right to kind of get your evaluation, but the athlete, the tools are there. But again, it, it, anytime you've got kind of these really polarizing opinions on a guy, 12 just seems way too high. And I think you were telling me in your first mock draft that you did, um, AJ McCarthy's there in the second round, right? Yeah. And JJ so, McCarthy going like 50, JJ. Uh, I yeah. think. And in, in when I, I did that, the one where Kayla Williams fell to second. So crazy. Yeah. So, so that that's kind of the, the story. Anytime a quarterback goes, that's surprising. Obviously, Talisi Fuaga is one of my favorite offensive line in the class. Not surprising. I think Dallas Turner is interesting. He's such an interesting prospect because he's immensely physically gifted. He just moves and bends like kind of like very Von Millerish, but like mm-hmm. not always has the best plan. And so, like it's totally a projection. So, I would probably take Latu or Jared Verse above him. But again, I that is not surprising to me that a team would fall in love with his ability and obviously the corners Quinion Mitchell and Arnold, I think are really exceptional fo- football players. Quinion Mitchell was the standout at the senior bowl. And I think he's going to be an excellent football player. So no, no surprise that, you know, a guy that was maybe a second round player now going top 20 strong senior bowl with strong college tape at a smaller level. That's what that'll do for you. So um, off the top of your head, is there anyone on the board right now where you're like, I would give up capital to go back into the first round and get him uh, knowing that, you know, kind of what's coming in these next 12 picks. So, you know me, Craig, and we've done a lot of shows together, done a lot, a lot of draft talk together. I'm not a big fan of giving up capital for a guy, even if I have a really high evaluation on him. So a guy that I really like is Darius Robinson. I love his film. I loved him at the Senior Bowl. Like, I've talked about him glowingly at every every facet. But I'm not going to overvalue my evaluation on him. And because I think there's other good football players that, and I want to make sure I can get two good football players instead of one good football player, right? I agree. That's ultimately yeah. my thought. So uh, we'll see as we go through here, but there's really, it, it'd have to be a very specific situation, you know, like obviously for quarterback. Let's say we traded out of that top spot, for example, and there we took a receiver, an offensive lineman, and there was a Bo Nix or a Penix or a um, JJ McCarthy. JJ, yeah. Then you'd probably, I'd consider trading back in. Yeah, that's that's the thing that I would say. If you have a quarterback that you love, and especially if you trade it out sooner and you pick up a little extra capital, that's buying you. You know, you're playing chess. You're thinking one or two moves ahead here, where like you trade back a a crew capital that you might use some of to trade back up later, because that fifth year option on a quarterback is so valuable. Slash, do you make sure you get your guy at the end of the first round? All right. So with that, let's let's go twelve picks. Let's finish out this first round, and then we'll get into the second and the commander. So the Dolphins on the clock at twenty one. 
Uh, they take uh, Mary's, Mary's Mims. Mims, tackle out of Georgia. Kool-Aid McKinstry, all-name team, cornerback, Alabama to the <laughs> Eagles. Uh, Jackson Powers Johnson, center out of Oregon to the Texans. Troy Franklin, receiver out of Oregon to the Cowboys. Your guy, Tyler Guyton, tackle mm-hmm. out of Oklahoma to the Packers. Brian Thomas, Jr., receiver, LSU to the Bucks. Braylon Shrice, edge, Washington uh, to Arizona. Ennis Rakestraw, Jr., uh, who is the cornerback out of Missouri to Buffalo. Kamari Lasseter, corner out of Georgia, well-liked by a lot of folks. Uh, he is going to the Lions. Lad McConkey, wide receiver out of Georgia uh, to the Ravens. So a couple of Georgia guys. Uh, but Jordan Morgan and then Byron Murphy, uh, the defensive uh, lineman out of Texas. They go the last two. So, Logan, uh Real quick, let's t- pick pick a guy or two that you want to talk about, and I'm going to reload this draft, uh, and and we'll get to the second round. Yeah, I mean, obviously the tackles going there, I think are it's, this is what it's going to look like, and they're going to be the guys that indicate the draft. And uh, Tyler Guyton, you know, with the Pro Bowl, with the Senior Bowl that he had, is going to go probably first round, right? The thing I love about that draft is that there's some good football players still on the board, like Lad McConkney going to um, uh, to Baltimore. I think is he's an excellent receiver, slot receiver, going to be an excellent pro. But that means that an edge, a tackle, gets pushed to the commander. So when you see picks like that, uh, Morgan going to um, going to San Francisco, I think is a really interesting pick because he's probably a guard, right? Would he add value to Washington potentially? But I think he's a better fit for that scheme there in San Fran. So again, that pushes players that again I think are better fits here in Washington, just and I think that's pretty uh, pretty exciting. So obviously, uh, you know. Lots of lots of things there in that last 12 that shape the, the, the first two picks of the second round for the Washington Commanders. So I don't know if you can see there as, I, as you were talking and I was fidgeting with reloading a draft, um, but I uh, we had Drake Mago number one three more times. So I had to reload the draft. I eventually took control of the Bears pick uh, to make sure that Caleb Williams went one. And we're going to hope that roughly the same guys go. And I would like the draft to start and Caleb Williams. And then I would like uh, Jaden Daniels to be my pick. And now all of a sudden, here we are on the clock again. Many of the same guys uh, go. We we see like Chris Braswell, the edge from Alabama, yeah. uh, go instead. So you have a, a couple of extra guys that come off the board. Your guy Tyler Guyton almost slipped all the way. Yeah, uh, and to if, us at, at thirty six, that would have been yeah. sick. And if he slips, I think you sprint that pick in. I think he's perfect fit for what they're trying to do. He's got a lot of upside potential. I think even Troy Fontenew, the guy that goes at thirty five. He's an excellent football player, you know, played tackle at uh, UW, probably more of a guard. Jonah Ellis goes at 33. Excellent pass rusher from Utah. Got a lot of juice, man. But if he goes, man, then another football player is going to fall. And so, again, I'm super stoked, right? I'm doing a victory lap because my one of my favorite players in the draft is there. That's Darius Robinson. So I'm probably going to say we should take him. But, Craig, you know, you, we got we to gotta work this out as, as a leadership group together. So let's talk through it. Yeah, let's take Darius Robinson. No, I, I do think that that's I do think that's the right pick here. Um, yeah. They need an they need an edge player. And I remember when we were talking about guys that you liked in the Senior Bowl, like you said, that's the guy that feels like a Commanders player. And as they yeah. try to establish that identity of, oh, that guy's a Steeler. That guy, you know, in Belichick's day or especially early Belichick days, that guy's a Patriot. Like you want to know who are the guys that really define what it means. And I would say, like for what when Kyle Smith was here, like what they were trying to build. Kyle or uh, John Allen was like that guy's a commander, mm. like just a super solid, tough, physical football player who just wants to line up and and kill somebody. Like that's what it was. You know, when Scott McLuhan was here, and and I don't mean to like we're not going to relitigate like those two eras, but like you know the good thing of what Scott had was a vision. Like Brandon Sheriff was the guy yeah. that he wanted to take overdraft for a guard at six. Sure. Uh, but like there was a reason there was an identity piece to that. And I think a guy like Darius Robinson, not only play style and what he can do in, in Dan Quinn's use of defensive linemen, um, a guy that can line up at multiple spots, like not in the same way that Michael Parsons can, but who can, um, yeah. but can line up with some versatility and, and bring an attitude and an edge and a finish and a strain and all those things that that DQ really wants. Um, but as an attitude type of thing, like he seems like a he seems like a guy that that could fit that. So 
Um, I think the other options are going big receiver, Keon Coleman, uh, Florida yeah. State is an option there. Um, I heard uh, Jordan Reed on Kimes podcast the other day. I say Xavier Leggett would be a great fit yep. uh, receiver from South Carolina. He's on the board here. And then you have offensive tackles uh, that I think you could potentially look at. Uh, Graham Barton out of Duke. I don't know what you think of him, but your guy, Patrick Paul, is an option. And then on the edge, you also have Chop Robinson out of Penn State. So I think those are kind of the guys that are in, you know, a Donnie Mitchell receiver out of Texas. Like yep. all those guys are in play here. Yeah, so I think Keon Mitchell is a guy that I think a lot of people like. I don't think he separates super well. And big receivers who don't separate, it makes me think of Keneal Harry. You know, like I'm just, it yeah. gets me really Kelvin nervous. Kelvin Benjamin, like yeah, those guys. Like, and Kelvin Benjamin worked in the NFL because he was so big. You know, he was 6'6", 250, like huge. This is not that guy. And I and again, like he's he's a big guy. He, his contested catch ability is off the chart, but I need to see his separate. I need to see some route nuance. So interesting to see how he runs. That's why I'm not super sold on him at the moment but we'll see what happens and then obviously um there's tj tampa who is an excellent corner out of i forget where he's from iowa state yes uh, iowa, iowa state. state yeah very good football player and again do you need to fill that need but to me it seems like edge and i one of the things i said uh on a show yesterday was like chop robinson maybe it's the penn state jersey um the explosiveness with which he plays with and listen to this listen to this comp craig he is not this player but the explosive juice he's got is very similar to Micah Parsons. Like it's very similar. It's not the same. Doesn't play with the same strength. I was gonna say. So what's the what's lacking to make sure that people understand the difference between the two? Doesn't have the same playing strength. Doesn't have the same power. Doesn't use his hands the same way. There's a lot of differences there. But I do think if you're like if you're Dan, you're like this guy played at Penn State. He's got. He's probably gonna run a four four. He's probably gonna jump forty inches. Like he is twitched up and explosive. And if as a defensive line coach, I can work stunts in games and get him sprinting like around like free rusher status, uh, I think that would be pretty impressive. So he's a guy that is kind of like my dark horse for this pick here. If he's available, I think this is too high for him to go, but I could see someone in the building falling in love with that just explosive pop that he's got. I mean, like we can make something out of this, but I do think Darius Robinson would be my pick here. So, and the other, I guess, option then would be go either wide receiver or tackle here and hope that Chop Robinson's available at 40 because we pick again very soon. So but you would just go to, Darius Robinson. According to my board, and this is just my board, obviously, I, I have like a borderline first round grade on Darius. So in terms of value, this is the Fine. more valuable pick. Yeah, so. All right, so Darius Robinson is the pick. Uh, then in between is it we have the the speed settings set to turbo. Keon Coleman goes after that. TJ Tampa, Michael Penix was still on the board by the way, as is JJ McCarthy. Yeah. Um, so now that leaves us with many of the same players. Uh, yeah. We got. Uh, um, Kieran, uh, I, I will know this name by the time the draft comes around. But Kieran Amadaje, Amadaje, Amadaje uh, the tackle out of Yale. Um, you have Zach Frazier, the center out of West Virginia. Good player. Uh, Graham Burton, tackle out of Duke. You got a couple of wide receivers in here from Mitchell from Texas, Walker from North Carolina, yeah. uh, Jermaine Burton from Alabama, Leggett. You still got Chop Robinson, but then you get to a guy I know you also like a lot, Patrick Paul, mm -hmm. the tackle out of Houston. Jalen Polk on the board, by the way, the wide receiver out of uh, Washington, who's a stud. Yeah, and Patrick Paul is incredibly raw, so is he going to come and start day one? Maybe, but I do think he's got the physical tools to get there. Can you go to the offensive line, Craig, Craig and just see who's available? Uh, do you want just tackle? Do you want guards too? Can we do both? Sure. Thank you. Uh, and do we got centers in here too? I guess that counts as interior line. Okay. Yeah. So the guy that I really like, honestly, and uh, people are sleeping on because he didn't go to the Senior Bowl, two guys here I want to point out. Yeah. Graham Barton from Duke is probably going to play guard, has played center, has played tackle, is a twitchy – Kind of reminds me of um, the guy at a Northwestern last year uh, who got drafted uh, by Skaronsky. Skaronsky, very similar, but I think he's a better athlete. So in terms of needs for the Commanders, like you can play guard, right? Fill that need, play center, right? I think that's another need, kind of hybrid need there. And I think he, in a pinch, could play tackle for you. So love him. Another guy that people aren't talking about, but I think they should be, is Kingsley Suamataya from BYU. Very raw prospect, big athletic heavy son of a gun right so i think he's a little bit more far he's a little farther along than um patrick paul for example but patrick paul i think ceiling is through the roof so if you want like a just a solid double here graham barton's your pick if you want someone who could be a home run patrick paul's your pick 
If you want another like triple kind of player, I think Kingsley Sue and Mataya. So, you know, I, I, in terms of offensive line, I think this should make Commanders fans feel really good. And the other guy is Christian Haynes from Connecticut. Had a great year, killed at the Senior Bowl. Like those are four dudes that are going to make you better right now. And they're all sitting right there for you. So let me just throw something out there because I feel like center has come up a couple times. Um, I know Jordan Reed mentioned it on John's pod, but like, didn't you draft Ricky Schomburg last year to play center? Yeah. Like no, you can't right. you can't have a third round pick who you just throw by the wayside. Like to me, Ricky Stromberg has to be your starting center this year. If yeah. not, then you wasted a third rounder, which, you know, hey, it was a different administration. It was what it was, but like I'm not drafting a guy to play center this year. I am unless I know like if I'm Adam Peters and I look at Cliff's offense and what he needs out of a center and I look at Ricky Stromberg and go, that is a mismatch. We can't do this. Like, and you're we're just gonna have to eat it. And he's gonna be our backup okay like if you know you're screwed but i have a hard time thinking with ricky stromberg and some of the promise he showed at guard last year and how intelligent he is and what people thought about him coming out that he can't come in and be your starting center from day one this year so i to me center is not a position that i'm spending a second round pick on yeah so the grand barton guy center guard and tackle and i think that left guard spot is something you're kind of trying to shore up maybe you like christian haynes a little bit better but again like i said those are four football players uh, again, Zach Frazier, I think you were talking about there. He's probably yeah. the best of this group. But those four guys, I think, are really excellent. And I think you – I don't say you can't go wrong with any of them, but that's kind of how I feel. And I think maybe Patrick Paul, because he's got the highest ceiling, that's what you take a swing on. I don't know. It's your call, Craig. What do you got? Oh, man. Where are you gonna, I'm going to my line coach, and that's as close thing we have as you. I'm going back <laughs> to you and be like, which of these guys do you want? Um, I would say, I would say, hey, I want to tackle. Which mm -hmm. guy do you want? I would probably go – I'd probably go Patrick Paul here. Okay. And it's close. Um, and, it's close between Kingsley Sumatai also. By but the way, he, uh, now we have the offensive line of brotherly love because Chris right. Paul uh, is, is already in house, but sorry, right, we'll go Patrick Paul. Um, that'll be our guy. And um, let's see what PFF thinks of our draft. I think they're going to like it quite a bit. They do. Jada Daniels an A, Darius Robinson, a minus Patrick Paul. They give a B minus. They have uh 49, uh, on the PFF big board and we took him at 40, but obviously positional need, a guy who can play tackle. Um, and by the way, like depending on what you do with Charles Leno and Andrew Wiley, like you could, you could have him red shirt a year, yeah. um, behind two super vets. Um, again, play style wise, who knows how they fit, but, um, that is definitely something to work out. And I also think worth mentioning at left guard, potentially like, could you kick Wiley inside? Um, that's, Maybe. that's something I've thought about too, of like, if you can get Schaumburg at center, Cosme at right guard, Wiley at left guard, and either keep Leno or you, you sign a free agent at one side and then draft the other, like that to me is not a bad way to remake this whole line pretty quickly on the fly. Um, but we'll ultimately see what what they want to do uh, there in uh, Dan Quinn's first year and, and what Adam Peters can, can engineer. All right, any uh, final thoughts on Mock Draft 1.0? No, but I think every time we do these, I think it's just important to know there are, even though like we picked Darius Robinson, Patrick Paul, Jaden Daniels, there are tremendously good football players in that same area that are going to add value you know that you might not know their name but gosh i just mentioned four offensive linemen that i could have picked there and felt really happy with right darius robinson like if that's chop robinson you know do we you know like it just it just depends on the fit and the vision of the of the team and and adam and dan and what they're doing so uh but yeah i think there's a lot of good football players and i'm really happy that they've got 36 and 40 to kind of actualize on the good football players at the top of this draft Totally. I, I think that to me is the big takeaway is like you could, I feel so good about those second rounders in a way I feel really good about two as well. Like yeah. two is a much, much bigger high wire act because at the end yeah. of the day, like you're trying to pick a franchise quarterback and like, that's, that's tough, but it, you're also looking at in that second round, a ton of wide receivers that probably be first rounders in other years um, that you could potentially take or an edge or a tackle. I feel pretty good about one of the guys that you really like being there at 36 and probably another one at 40. So um, plenty of opportunities. And of course, having those two picks means you could make some package deals, uh, you know, elsewhere in the draft, go back in the first round. There's, there's just so many options. And a guy like Adam Peters has navigated all of this before. All right. Uh, next week on the show, we got a couple of guests that we're working on, uh, get some more in, uh, you know, obviously more, uh, perspectives on the draft where Washington could slash should, go uh we'll we'll be talking about the draft plenty we'll start to get some free agent looks as well and then uh we also i guess we'll have a, the final coaching staff that we can talk about too so all of that and then the week after that we're off to indy logan 
That's so right. people can look forward to take command from Indianapolis. Maybe I think I've, I got to see what days I'm doing the show. Maybe one of those two days, Tuesday or Thursday. Cause like one of the days my flight, I think it's Thursday on my flight out. I won't do the show, the radio show on Thursday. Maybe we'll do a live show from Indy. Oh, that could be, be fun. Cool. That would be fun. So yeah. we'll, we'll sit down and we'll do a, we'll do a live show from Indianapolis. So just putting, putting that out there. Uh, if you, if you, you made it this far in the podcast and you like that idea, tweet me so that I know that people are into it. Cause I don't want to do a live show for no one. Cause that would be, that'd be sad. All right. Uh, we'll see you next time on take Command. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command. First, why don't, you, why don't you like it? It lets other people know that it was good and then they should watch it too. And Logan, we have a new exclusive home for full episodes. We do, 1067 The Fans YouTube page. Go check it out and please subscribe. Yeah, do, do what Logan said. Do He's it. Very, very smart. <laughs>